in Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, who at every turn have chosen power and money. Author and intellectual Anang Yudardas was on MSNBC with Ali Velshi, where he gave a good summary of the interesting shift seen in the Democratic Party this year. Check it out. The, the year that we've been living through is actually even more remarkable in that contest. And the question for 2021 was, was it going to be the bookend to 1981? And there's a powerful symmetry to this year and this era. Joe Biden it, it, it voted for some of the 1981 Reagan tax and government cuts that in a way launched this era as a matter of policy. And 40 years later, Joe Biden, a historic moderate, came into office and got into an improbable coalition with progressives who had fought him in the election, who had lost the election, but who in many ways were winning the war of ideas. And this year has been defined in my analysis by a historically moderate president who actually had a capacity to evolve and grow and, and hear some of the data you're talking about, hear a changing conversation. And progressives who had fought that president tooth and nail mm -hmm. and have actually had his back through this process have actually been the real protectors of his double-barreled agenda. And the surprise of this year has been the people traditionally closest to Joe Biden politically in Congress have hamstrung him mm -hmm. at every turn have been the people trying to sabotage his agenda at every turn. The people who are, the, in a way, the heroes of trying to get something done this year are the people who understand coalition. And that's, I would say, Joe Biden. I would say that's Ron Klain, for sure, in the White House. I would say that's Pramila Jayapal. I would say that's AOC, that's Bernie. People who tried to figure out how a big tent could get big things yep. done. And, and the tragedy, the tragic disappointments of this year are the political sadists and crony opportunists in Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, who at every turn have chosen power and money over helping people. I am a writer. I'm not a th licensed clinician. I can't diagnose what's going on with Manchin and Cinema. I can't prescribe remedies. But I do know there are therapies available out there for people who derive pleasure from hurting millions of people. All right. So I agree with a lot of that. I have some slight disagreements on, on a bit of it. I'll get to that in a second. But first, it's just good to see. It's always good to see Manchin and Cinema just completely torn apart on in the mainstream press because for so long and, and still on some on some uh, uh, cable news shows, they're treated as like these brilliant voices. Oh, these these amazing moderates. They're in the middle. They're with the American people. They, they just want to get a good deal done. They just care about what's best for the American people. Like now that we are finally having that veil lifted and and exposed, uh, exposing what they actually are fighting for, massive corporations, their own personal wealth, it, there finally is more of that education being done in the mainstream press over their motivations, over money and politics and all of that, that largely up to this point has been ignored by the mainstream. So Mansion and Cinema have done a wonderful job allowing us to educate people uh, on a larger scale on just uh, what politics in Washington is about. Now, in terms of the disagreements, I mean, I, I largely agree with what, what Anand is saying here, but in terms of Joe Biden's political evolution, it's largely just been rhetoric so far. I mean, you could say him pulling out of Afghanistan was a real turning point in terms of him actually doing something that's, that's different than the norm. So I think that is worth pointing out. That was great. But when it comes to economic policy, when it comes to domestic policy, it largely has been rhetoric. Now, you can fault Mansion Cinema for not, you know, supporting the $3.5 trillion budget bill and, and so not allowing it to pass. But still, Biden, if he cared enough, could be fighting them in ways that he is not willing to fight them, or at least hasn't so far. I mean, we've seen him over the years fighting uh, much louder for fiscal responsibility than he is right now to fight to pass these uh, these provisions in the budget bill. So he could be using, as I've said a million times, Joe Manchin's daughter, the Epen scandal, going after his daughter for that or or threatening to. Um, with cinema, it's a little tougher because who the hell knows what cinema actually wants. Uh, but, you know, we're going to see. I really thought at this point <laughs> this, this spending fight would be over. It's still going on. So we have to wait and see still what's going to happen with this. But with the Democratic Party, or I should say the Progressive Caucus, appearing to just lay down and now 
caving to support the uh, the infrastructure bill before the budget bill is passed in the Senate, they're losing all their leverage. I just I can't envision a world where all of a sudden Joe Manchin and Cinema agreed to support the budget bill just because it passed the House after they fought fought it this long. So unless it's cut down considerably, for even from where it is right now, I I don't know how it's going to pass. Now, also in terms of um. In terms of Biden, it is, as Anand points out there, it is, uh, it's almost funny to, to see Biden actually read the room, realize he can't be the same person he was. He can't keep complaining about crime and spending the way he was in the 80s and 90s. He has actually turned, at least again, in his rhetoric. But it's still, <laughs> it's it's interesting to see that a man of that age that's been in the Senate that long actually has the capacity to change. And it goes to what I talked about when I was talking about Biden before the election. He's a guy, I think, that is largely influenced by the culture around him. So, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, the, the big discussion was about spending. It was about, uh, you know, crime and that sort of thing. So he was, he was with Republicans on those talking points because he thought that's what was popular. What's popular now is actually helping people, is paid leave, expanding Medicare, higher taxes on the wealthy. These things are now popular, or at least more. Uh, they were they always were popular, but in terms of being publicized more, they're talked about a lot more than they used to be. And Biden is at least, again, rhetorically on board with that. And it's, it's you know, not many politicians are able to make that, that shift that late in their career, but it is uh, good at least to see Biden willing to make that shift, again, at least rhetorically. But um, this la last point I want to make, the idea of a big tent party. So Anand there talks about how, you know, AOC, Bernie, uh, Jayapal, some others see uh, Biden, see the uh, potential of, of a big tent party, which makes sense if you're talking about the voters, makes less sense if you're talking about lawmakers in Washington. You can't really have a big tent that that has the aim of helping people if part of, if a large contingent of that big tent are just corporate tools. If you have the majority of Democratic lawmakers still fighting for their own interests in terms of winning the next election, in terms of looking at what their donors want and ensuring they keep those people happy, then Big Ten doesn't, isn't good. <laughs> Big Ten is actually a negative. But if you're talking about the voters and, and, you know, getting people involved in terms of fighting for the working class across all spectrums, then yes, of course, Big Ten is great. But, uh, there is a downside to Big Tent when we're talking about having, you know, corruption in that Big Tent because that corruption will always be the most or the, the loudest voice in the room will have the, the most power as we have seen over the past 40 years with the Democratic Party. But hopefully that changes. It is slowly changing in terms of who's taking over, who's winning these primary races. You're going to see more of those challenges uh, come up for, for next year. And, you know, it's, it's a slog, it's a slow process, but until progressives really hold power in leadership positions, be it in Congress, in the White House, you're not going to see the real shift that is necessary until those progressives take those sorts of positions.